All right, thank you. Everybody uh, joining our first webinar of this uh, publication and research communication webinar series. We're very happy to have you because of the time. So we'll start right on time. Uh, so first thing uh, we have uh, Gracian Chimwasa, am I correct? <laughs> Gracian Chimwasa to open the session for us. And um, just give a little introduction. Gracian is an executive director for ITOCA, which is Information Training and Outreach Center for Africa, based in South Africa. ITOCA is a research for night partner focusing on outreach and user capacity development. Gracian serves on several Research for Life committees, and he is the current vice chair of the Research for Life Executive Council. He has experience in designing and leading research and development projects. So Gracian, the floor is yours now. If you want to share screen, please do so. Okay, no, I'm fine. Thank you, Kathy. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those that are in the West region and those who are in the East region, it's already in the evening. So good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Welcome to this special training webinar. It is part of a series of uh, six webinars that Research for Life has developed focusing on publishing and research communication. These are the processes that we are focusing on now. As many of you would know, over the last two decades, Research for Life has been focusing on access to literature. And that has gone very well with many partners that have joined us, including the publishers, the universities that are providing the technical assistance, and those that are providing outreach and capacity development for the users. So we are quite excited that in this phase, we'll be focusing on publishing and research communication processes so the idea is to focus on those users who would like to publish their literature that they've worked on having done some research. Many of our partners here are publishers and in their houses, they've got a lot of experience and expertise in publishing. Henceforth, we are leveraging those experiences and expertise in this series. That is a pilot series that we are running. We therefore expect that we will be learning also since this is a pilot and we'll hear from you in terms of how you take it, your experiences, and what's the kind of focus you'd like us to spend time on. So welcome to this um, training. We look forward to hearing from you and we hope that it will be as interactive as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gratian. That's a nice introduction for us. And so right now I will take the floor and do some uh, housekeeping things. So again, this is the webinar one. This is a, I'm doing a little bit introduction of the webinar series for you. And uh, as Gretchen said, and I just want to give you some background, uh, we are structure our webinars along a very simple research flight cycle, which is uh, guided from the Medical Library Association. Oh, by the way, I'm the retur uh, I'm a retiree from US National Library of Medicine. So I'm a medical librarian. So this is deep to my heart. So um, this, this is linear, but actually the dissemination process will feed back to the idea of development. So um, we have six webinars. So uh, this nice little uh, graphic telling you how the webinar one we are focusing on the uh, uh, we are giving you a little bit of background of uh, search and access literature and also formulating research question. And for that moment too, we'll set, give you a research landscape, which is focusing on open science. And three, about the, uh, uh, about the funding and proposal uh, de development phase. Um, and the number four is about conducting research or specialized in ethics. And, four and uh, five and six is about disseminating your research output and uh, in talking about the impact of research. And it will be two webinars in each month, May, uh, two in June, 
and two in July. So as Beijing already pointed out, is a collaboration about multiple partners in Research for Life. And our target audience is Research for Life uh, eligible country, people from them, and for their life attendancy. But the recordings and material will be freely available on this Research for Life site. So um, we also specifically will focus on uh, our talking point uh, focusing on the challenges of the uh, people from research for like country, MRC countries are facing. So today's talk, topic, uh, we already finished this one and then we'll move on to the uh, uh, telling you a little about how to imp improve research skill in a structural way. And then we'll move on to talking about search and access literature as an initial part of your research, and then the formulating re research question. Each part we will have a little bit of Q&A after that, and then at the end we'll have another longer Q&A to wrap, to wrap up. So without, I'm sorry, this I should stop sharing <laughs> because that's at the end. And without, uh, without you know, further to do, and I'll leave, give the floor to, uh, we're moving on to the next part is understand or we have, we're very glad to have two guests from Elsevier Researcher Academy to present the understanding research cycle in a structural way um, for us. And uh, Ying Si Wen is a project marketing manager at Elsevier based in Amsterdam. In her current research role, uh, she oversees Elsevier's e-learning platform, Researcher Academy, and works on experts in the industry to develop learning and training resources that support early career research, early career researchers in navigating their research journey. She has a master's degree in communication science from the University of Amsterdam. This, another presenter from Elsevier is Anna Morsinger. She has been working at Elsevier for five years with a background in marketing and consumer behavior. And as a project marketing manager, she is responsible for helping authors to find right journal for their manuscript. This includes working on e-learning platform, Researcher Academy. So the floor is yours, Anna and Lindsay. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. So I will be walking through the research life cycle and I will try to provide some useful tips and important aspects of the cycle. Uh, Kathy already introduced me, so that's perfect. But the, to, to give a little bit more background on Researcher Academy, Researcher Academy, it's a free to use e-learning platform um, that it's really, the goal is to help early career researchers in their uh, research career. Uh, I'm clicking, but... Sorry, my, my keyboard does not. OK, there we go. So um, our, our e-learning material fits into this research life cycle where you see uh, the image. So the first step is the what you see on top, uh, research preparation, followed by writing for research, and then publication process. Then comes peer review. And lastly, it's about communicating your research. Um, so as a researcher, we believe it's important to understand this cycle because it can help you in three ways. Firstly, having an understanding of all the steps will make you uh, well equipped and prepared for what's coming next. Most importantly, you will grasp at that each of these steps are interconnected and, and it's, it's, it's a piece of a puzzle. So every time you're working on this, the piece of the puzzle will become the end result in that sense. And secondarily, you will have the awareness to know that you've successfully completed that step and you can move on to the next one. And lastly, um, everything I say today doesn't necessarily mean it's applicable to you. So um, knowing about the research life cycle, what that allows you to do, it enables you to design your own research path that is applicable to your uh, objectives. Um, so 
I want to start off saying first, uh, I have a lot of text in my slides, so I just wanted to make sure that uh, if you ever read these slides after my presentation that everything sticks. So uh, please forgive me for the amount of context that you see in the, in the upcoming slides. So the first step is research preparation. Uh, I will talk about three important components, but please be aware that there are more to it. Uh, funding is very important in, in the research preparation. Your application needs to be successful in order to continue your research. So uh, making sure you read the guidance notes, seek out advice from your community, your, your peers, supervisors, professors, also use them as well to prepare well for these interviews and, and do mock interviews as well. And also while writing your application for funding, please keep the reviewers in mind. And in each slide, you will see here that uh, I added webinars as well from Researcher Academy if you wish to deep dive more in, into these topics and become uh, more uh, of an expert in these topics. Um, secondarily, we have data management. Now, this step, it's not only about funding that you need to uh, manage that data, it goes beyond that. If you manage your data in that correct way, already in this step, it's connected to the step of publishing because um, there are multidisciplinary journals that you, that you can publish your, your data. So uh, and also on top of publishing your article, you can also separately publish your data. Of course, I have to mention an Elsevier journal uh, that does that, which is Data and Brief, but we're not the only one. Uh, many reputable publishing companies have a journal just, just like uh, Data and Brief. Um, so that so get, getting getting published as well in an additional uh, journal can also increase your chances of getting cited. Um, uh, the, the third one is research collaboration. So expanding your network and, and creating a global uh, collaboration is important for your research. Here you will define who you will collaborate with. And also this last part research collaboration is connected to the next step, which is writing your research because here it's important already to establish roles. So who's going to be the primary author, uh, who will be the co corresponding author, and so on. So here already you want to be thinking about the next step in the research cycle. So yes, the second step, uh, writing for research. So I will be mentioning two parts. And further in this presentation, uh, we will also be discussing about formulating your research questions. But for this part, um, it's about preparing your manuscript. Th that is quite crucial. If you, you, if you can already start thinking already about the next step as well, which is publishing your research as well, because here uh, you can already have a journal in mind that you wish to publish in. And already in, at this step, you can uh, read the journal's guide for authors to get a better understanding of uh, how you have to structure your manuscript in, uh, for, for the journal to, to accept you. So a manuscript should normally have a title, abstract, keywords, introduction, methods, results, discussion, conclusion, acknowledgments, references, and also supporting materials. So keywords here, sp specific keywords, they're not only important for indexation, but they're also important for the last step, which is communicating your research. Because keywords, especially if they're repeated enough in your research, in your, in your manuscript, it increases your search engine optimi optimization, uh, which we say SEO. And that means that your chances of your article uh, appearing on a search engine increases uh, the more you repeat that keyword in, in, in your manuscript. Also, as, 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 as I mentioned, the order of authorships, you should already have it in order before you even start this step. Um, and also, if you wish to learn more about authorships and, and ethics and if, if you should be considered a primary author or, or, or anything like this, we do have a webinar that, that touches on this. Um, a short title is very important to grab the, the to grab the reader's attention, and also a clear abstract. Really, um, some uh, see it as if you have a clear abstract, it's the gatekeeper, and it will uh, on the chances of of your paper getting published or not. So this is this second step is important if you're writing a review article, especially if you're new to the research community you need to start thinking about a proposal. So a proposal is not only about you 
introducing your research to editors in hopes that it will get published, but it's also how you're introducing yourself to, to editors. It's, it's also an important networking um, opportunity in that sense. So a proposal needs a clear description, explanation why it's a good fit to the journal, a list of key research articles, and also uh, if potentially doesn't necessarily have to, but include a, a summary of the intended uh, audience. So here we are in the third stage uh, publication process. So a lot goes on when publishing an article. It's not simply that the author submits the paper and when it gets accepted, it's, it's a simple click and it's online. Uh, so if you're fully aware of all the mechanisms and uh, the people that are involved in the publishing process, that could really help uh, manage expectations and make you feel more confident in that sense. So we do have a webinar that really uh, deep dives into this um, on the whole process of the journal cycle. And here in the publication process, uh, you might still not really, you might still not be sure of, of what journal you want to publish in. And that's fine. That's also completely normal. It doesn't, you don't have to necessarily already have the journal in mind while you're writing it. And when you're thinking about what journal, to publish in, you might um, ask your peers, your supervisors, and 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 or also search yourself for the, for the journal. But there's also uh, tools online that can help you match your abstract to uh, relevant journals using uh, NLP or AI, as as we like to say as well. Um, so at Elsevier, uh, we have a tool that's called Journal Finder that can match up to 50 journals. It's free to use. And also with a Journal Finder, you can see all the metrics for those journals that can help you uh, evaluate if you wanna submit to that journal. So we have the speed, impact factor, acceptance rate, and so on. But speaking about metrics, that goes to my next step. Um, we have a lot of metrics uh, uh, that have been um, created. We have impact factor, we have, uh, we have SNP, we have SJR, we have site score and acceptance rate and everything. So it's a lot uh, to, to understand and a lot to, to think about. Um, so it can be very confusing on, on what they mean and when you should use it or why you should use it. So during this time, it's also, it's not only important to know what metrics to use, but also it's important to know the difference between a reliable or pre predatory journal and spot the differences uh, between, between those two in that sense. So uh, Research for Life will actually have a, a webinar uh, and really deep dive into th this fourth stage. So I don't want to go too much in it, but. In this fourth stage, this can be a very stressful, frustrating, but also joyful time. It's all at once, uh, these emotions that you can feel. Um, but knowing the process of pre-review in this step can really ease that feeling. Also, you might want to know uh, how to respond to reviewers. Um, is there a correct way and, uh, to respond to feedback in that sense? So uh, we also have webinars really deep diving to that as well. And also, you might start thinking about becoming a reviewer because that is a very important step in your, or it can be an important step in your career. I don't want to say it is, but it can be. So uh, we also have a certified peer review course uh, to help you become, to become one in that sense. But really this is just uh, out, outlining um, what, what is involved in, in, in a peer review and, and uh, hopefully Knowing this can also help you understand um, um, the feedback that you might receive and, and what it means. So we come to the, uh, uh, the fifth stage. Um, this is about communicating your research. So uh, your work has been published and, but also you wanna make sure your work uh, has an impact. And in order for your work to have, to have an impact, it needs to be read, it needs visibility in that sense. And, and there's several ways to, to communicate your, your, your research. Here I touch in these three aspects. Number one, we have lay summaries. So lay summaries, it, it can increase, if, if you believe your, your research is, is newsworthy, 
this is the direction that you, you normally have to go. Um, so if you believe that your research is groundbreaking or it really can capture the attention, you would, you would need to know how to write a lay summary. And this also makes, um, this also makes your research accessible to, to, to and easy to understand in that sense. So secondly, conferences, they're, they're very important. Um, as, as a researcher, uh, you, you need to attend conferences in that sense. It's, it's part of your, of, your, of your role. So uh, with conferences, this can also, you can already start thinking about this already in the first step. When you're uh, when you're collaborating with with your community and with your research community, because you can already ask um, uh, your research community what what conferences might be important for me to attend. So you already have it in mind, and you already have it in mind how you will uh, create visibility uh, for your research in that sense. Um, lastly, social media. Uh, this day and age, so social media it's it's very important in the digital age. Um, so usually uh, what can happen when you publish your research in a publishing company, it can be that there's some marketing activities in, uh, for, for, the, for your article. It's not always guaranteed. So another way uh, to, to make sure that your, your article uh, reaches beyond your community and, and, and beyond uh, who you know is by posting it on social media and, and building that digital presence in that sense. Uh, so uh, here I have the, the key takeaways um, of, of, of this presentation. So before you, you start writing, um, make sure you already have the authorships in order. That's already important that is connected uh, to, to step one. Um, also, to increase your chances to, to get to get cited, make sure already uh, that uh, in step one you're managing your data because that will increase your chances of, of to get published and also increase your chances of, of getting cited and increase your visibility in that sense. Um, and there's a lot of uh, uh, journals out there. It's not only data. We also there's also software and, and hardware if that's if that's applicable to 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 what you're working on as well. Um, while preparing your manuscript and defining the key keywords, keep in mind while you're writing um, that it, in a way that you can repeat these keywords in a very uh, aligned and structured way. Not that I'm saying that you have to mention it in every page or, or mention it a, a thousand times in, in, in one uh, article. That's not necessarily what I mean, but uh, make sure when it's relevant uh, that you can uh, continue um, using that, that keywords and repeating it because that will help uh, with your last step about communicating your research and, and your article being uh, easier to find in, in a search engine. So while already writing your research and if you already have a journal in mind, make sure you can already, instead of waiting for the step of uh, the next step of publishing, make sure already while you're writing uh, your journals, you're thinking of, uh, you, you've taken a look at the guide for authors and making sure that your manuscript is, is ordered correctly. Um, so that was it. I think it was uh, quicker than I expected. So, but I hope it was uh, insightful. So I guess next is uh, Yingxi. You have about five minutes, actually. <laughs> oh, nice. No, I, I was just me presenting, sorry. That was our presentation. Oh, oh okay, yeah. okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> but nice, okay. I didn't, uh, so I thought I was very short, but it's good to know that I still oh, had no, five no, minutes it's left. Fine, it's fine, <laughs> it's okay, so we can take more time to address a question. I actually was typing away and uh, I make some mistake. Uh, uh, in that. So there is some question in the uh, Q&A session. So uh, I, let me just answer it quickly, just pretty much housekeeping. Uh, we won't have a French translation at this time. Uh, again, this 
project is the research seminar series. Remina series is a pilot project. We're just testing to see, because this is the first time that Research of Alliance is really uh, doing this kind of webinar and focusing on the whole publishing and research combination uh, series. And we're testing out, see what works and what doesn't. So now we understand that, uh, okay, then it's translation and a certificate. Then another question will be the certificate. And we, we take it as a lesson learned, and this time we won't offer certificate. Uh, at, at least at this time, but we will take the attendance and for our internal study to see, uh, you know, how, what's the impact. And um, so that's what I have. So any question live, I do have some few, I do have a few questions from, do you want me to address it on like formula research question, formulating research question? Or are you asking? Uh, I I'm asking I, Yeah. Uh, or or you want to address the question that you uh, related to your presentation? Why away? We have about three minutes for this. Well, I see um, some. The first question that was asked by Sandra for repeating the keywords. Can we use their abbreviations? Yes. Um. So, I I would suggest. Uh, keeping the consistency, so using the full full words, unless you want to do a mix and also use abbreviations and keywords. But you also have to keep in mind if somebody goes on Google or any other search engine, when they want to search a keyword, would they normally use the abbreviations or would they spell out, sp spell out the full word? Uh, what number of the keywords should we repeat in the manuscript a minimum? That is a very good question. Um, I think it also depends on your manuscript, how many pages, how many words it is. So I cannot give a direct answer to that, but I would say it at least three um, minimum in that sense. But it also depends on on a lot. And is it possible to incorporate copyright in social media? Um, I'm not necessarily sure what that means. Uh, specifically, um, I don't know if, um, or I will, I will type, I will ask you, Emmanuel, I will type uh, an answer and give you a, a full description about that. In the lay summary submitted with the main works to reviewers or after the article, is the lay summary submitted with the main work to reviewers or after the article has been accepted for publication? So yes, the lay summary should be after it gets accepted for publication because the lay summary normally it's used to um, if you if you really think your research is is media worthy and news breaking and groundbreaking and and news worthy, then um, that that's when you should start writing and after it's uh, pub, uh, publicated because then you know it was published in a reliable journal and 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 the media will, will also want to know that in that sense. Uh, hi there, I'm wondering how much time do you generally spend on preparing for an article draft while doing other texts, doing other research, studying, working? Also, how long do you usually hear from the journals? Uh, that's, um, <laughs> I'm not a researcher myself, so I'm, I'm not sure um, how much time is generally spent on preparing for an article draft. If anyone here has any insight on that, uh, that would also be useful for me. And also, how long do you usually hear from the journals? That really depends on, on the journal. Um, usually, journals do have speed. So you'll see a time to first decision, uh, which it will give you an indication of, of how long it will take to receive a first, uh, first, uh, this, uh, first response. But that doesn't necessarily, it's not set in stone. So if the journal says four weeks, it might also take you seven, eight weeks. And it's just an average in that sense. Um, but I know editors really try uh, hard to, to respond as fast as they can. Yeah, it all kind of depends on the journals and publishing uh, company too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, for now, I have to cut it. And yeah, no uh, uh, Anna and Ingsi, by all means, and answer the question in the Q&A box. Uh, you can type it in or, yeah, I think type it in public yeah, better because perfect. a lot of yeah. them seem to be very specific question interest to like the specific person. 
Yeah. So without further to do, I will move on to the next part, which we will move on to the next part about uh, searching and access literature. And we have we are happy to have two of our research for like research uh, capacity development committee co-chairs to present to us about this part. They have been doing this uh, about searching and searching literature and accessing literature all the time for many years. So let me do a brief introduction. We have Jihan L. Jiraya. Uh, he, she is a technical assistant in the Department of Science, Information and Dissemination at the World Health Organization Regional Office for Eastern Mediterranean Region. She is responsible for the Virtual Health Sciences Library portal, including the WHO Index Medicus for the Eastern Mediterranean Region. She is in charge of the updating of the EMLO collection in the Institution Repository Information Sharing and Regional Sales and Distribution for WHO Information Product. Jihan is in charge of the Arabic and, and French translation of training materials and Arabic uh, websites of Research for Life program, particular Hinari. Uh, she's the co-chair, of course, I just said that, of the Research for Life Capacity Development Community, Committee. And another presenter is Lenny Wine. Uh, you probably know him already, has been involved in projects focusing on electronic delivery of information to LMICs since 1998, long time ago. In 2006, he became a trainer for Hinari and then Research for Life. For 2006 to 2021, Lenny coordinated Librarians Without Border at the Medical Library Association program that was funded by the Elsevier Foundation. He has been the co-chair of the Research for Life Capacity Development Committee since 2019, and also is the Research for Life Capacity Development Senior Advisor to the Country Connection Projects. So without further ado, do, your floor is yours, Jihan and Lenny. Thank you, Kathy. I will share, I will start to share my screen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening everywhere. Today, I will have the pleasure to take you in a quick brief in the Unified Counter the Portal for the Research for Life. Now, why uh, we are using Research for Life and why we should use Research for Life? Uh, the Research for Life initiative is to reduce the knowledge gap between high-income countries and low- and middle-income countries by providing affordable access to important scientific research and resources. And this knowledge gap was due to the subscriptions, high costs for scientific literature that have been unaffordable for universities and research institutes in low-income countries. And starting from early 2000s, Cost uh, cutting became an issue even in wealthy countries. In addition to this, high subscription costs for a single journal title, access to a wide range to, uh, of scientific journals became out of reach for most communities in the world, and this increased uh, the knowledge gap among them. The Research for Life is a public private partnership of uh, five. UN agencies, uh, FAO, WHO, UNEP, WIPO, ILO, and up to 155, sorry, other international publishers. And since 2002, Research for Life provided researchers from uh, uh, low and middle income countries with free or low cost online access to an amazing collection up to 151,000 leading journals um, in the fields of agriculture, environment, applied science, and uh, global uh, justice, as well as health. This is for Hinari. Actually, the eligibility of countries is assessed once uh, a year 
It depends on different factors that define if a, if a country will be eligible to be part of uh, Group A countries that have free access or Group B that have uh, fee-based access. Group B countries must pay a sum of $1,500 per calendar year to obtain access to research for life. Only institutions in eligible countries can access research for life, and these include national universities, professional schools, research institutes, teaching hospital and healthcare centers, government uh, offices, national libraries, agricultural extension centers, uh, local non-governmental organizations. This map shows uh, uh, the countries that are, uh, are assigned to group A in uh, blue color, group B, orange color, not eligible countries, uh, white color, not applicable in um, maybe gray or natural color. Coming to the registration for Research for Life collection, only institutions are uh, eligible for registration, individuals are not. Therefore, I please urge you, when you are, uh, or before you start the registration, please check the list of registered institutions. And if your institution is already or previously registered in this list, please do not go to the registration again, but please uh, go to your uh, librarian, since all institutions are appointing the librarian and uh, uh, giving him the username and password to share it with the users and to ensure that users understand the proper use of research for life. Uh, for more information in this regard, you can uh, consult your librarian, you can uh, consult the help desk, and I will be more than happy if you can, if you want to uh, consult me, I will leave you my email uh, address at the end in the chat box. And in case that uh, the registration is not uh, registered or previously registered in Research for Life, you will find a step-by-step uh, -step guide on how to register uh, online. You will find it available at the Research for Life website. Then uh, you can, after uh, you have a great idea or a good idea about uh, how to register online, you may fill the registration form and submit it, uh, it will be delivered to the Research for Life report who will review your uh, request, and then you will receive an email with further instruction. The Research for Life working page displays the uh, summon uh, search box uh, that uh, links to citations and full text available in your country. You can simply uh, type here your, uh, your query, click on the magnified uh, glass, and you will retrieve the, uh, the results that relates to your uh, query. At the top here, you, uh, you will find uh, the content uh, drop-down list, the collection, the helpful help page, and from here, you may change the uh, language, the, your interface language to Spanish, Portuguese, French, Arabic, and Russian. You may notice this intelligent uh, person symbol. Uh, if you are correctly or properly uh, logged in to Research for Life, it turned out to white. Originally, uh, the symbol is in black, and it will display your institution uh, or faculty information here as we are using a training uh, uh, in here username and password it displays the national non-governmental login and at the end you will find the hamburger menu as i just mentioned uh, the content drop down list displays journals books tap sources databases free collection publisher and so on you may select one uh, of these and the collection drop down list uh, you can access Hineri, Agora, RG, Guali, uh, and Uwari uh, collections. And this is the, the uh, original symbol for uh, the personal uh, symbol in black. 
uh, this is a simple uh, example for the database's uh, beginning list and journal's beginning list. As I just mentioned, this is the uh, hamburger menu. Uh, you may click on reports or country offer. Uh, country offer from where you can find out what you can get in your country. I here selected uh, Bhutan and teaching hospitals. Uh, you can see here a list of more than 57,000 uh, books, 10, 000, uh, more than 10,000 journals, 26 reference sources, and 15 databases. Uh, you can see here, or you will notice the uh, small green box that indicates that this content is available in your country. Back to the uh, Research for Life welcome page and the Intelligent Salmon uh, search box, um, where you can run a keyword search in the Search for Life that is mapped in your country from this intelligent box. As I just mentioned, mentioned that just uh, type your uh, query, select uh, magnify glass, and it will, uh, your result will be displayed. And you can find it in um, uh, all other quarters, the five quarters, it will be displayed at the top right of the page. And this is the figure. The, the fruitful training material page, where you can find a lot of materials. You can find, the, if you are a librarian, you can uh, find the librarian hub. If you are uh, a publisher or interesting about publishing, you can find the author hub. Uh, you can find the information uh, about MOOC as well. Um, you can download the presentation, uh, study, or uh, the user. Uh, a whole series, we have a whole series of uh, webinars. You can download and listen to these webinars. You may access the Search for Life throughout this URL, and you may access the Training Librarian Hub as well throughout this URL. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for listening to me in my short presentation. This was a very quick briefing about the Research for Life portal. If you need any other uh, clarification, you need uh, any um, queries, you may uh, come to me, you may send me an email or uh, consult the Research for Life help desk. Thank you uh, very much. And I will leave you uh, within the very safe hand of my colleague, Professor Lee. Let me please. OK. Uh, you have to close your screen, and yes. then I'll start from that point. OK. All right. Let's see if I can share my screen quickly. I think this is where we are. All I have to do is click on from current slide. OK. All right, so now we're going to get in a little bit. Oh, I skipped already. We're going to talk about the nitty gritty of how to start a project, identifying information resources, the outline of information access tools. I'll try not to speak too quickly. Types of access tools, types of information sources, scholarly information sources, and evaluating information resources. Now, remember, you will have access to all these presentations, and we, especially since many of them have links to the other documents that we are uh, citing, OK? So I will now continue on to the next slide. Uh, hold on a second. When starting a research project, it's important to know where to find information and what types of resources are offered in what kinds of access services. These services and platforms are called access tools. Uh, you're, uh, and then please note, not all access tools are free of charge. So you may get to a database that asks you for a subscription. Okay, always start with your library, uh, what collections you have, and then go to Research for Life. So you have types of access tools. You have library catalogs, and discovery tools that may uh, have been subscribed to by your institution. 
And in a sense, Research for Life becomes a catalog of material that is accessible in your institution. You have databases, many of them by publishers, some are for free, some are free of charge. A good example of a database in health is Hanari from the National Library of Medicine with over 30 million citations in it. Another good example in agriculture is Agris. Okay, you have repositories from uh, different institutions. Uh, this Many of this may include articles, proceedings, reports, research data that have not been published. Uh, it's called gray literature, and there are a whole series of uh, tools to find the gray literature, but we don't have time for that today. You have indexes. There are bibliographic and citation indexes used for literature searching, and this is where PubMed f fill falls in under. And you have web search engines. Uh, the slide we're using mentions Google, but we would also, of course, encourage you to use Scholar, which is focusing on research and academic literature. Okay, we have three kinds of sources, primary sources, formal appearance. Uh, that's where the original idea is, their new research theories are, that's where the data is. Examples, interviews, analyzed field data, original experiments or research. Secondary sources interpret the primary sources. They analyze, review, summarize information, okay? Secondary sources give you a lot of useful background information. Review articles, academic books, dissertations. Tertiary sources are based on these first two sources and provides data within a context which can help researcher interpret information, give you background information, examples on encyclopedias, textbooks, indexes, and bibliographies. I will quickly show you an example. This journal article has tables in it. That is primary source information. It is giving you the data that you can interpret, that you can use in your own research, that you can analyze. Okay, so that's a primary source. This second one, recent advances in understanding dengue, is a, see what it says, a selective review of recent publications, clinical features, epidemiology, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is summarizing the current research, would be very valuable at the beginning of your literature search. And the third is an example, it's actually from Elsevier's Clinical Key. It's an overview, clinical overview of dengue fever, and you get some general information background information. This can be useful at the beginning when you're starting to do research, okay? Scholarly information sources, most of you know these. Academic peer-reviewed journals, monographs, thesis and dissertations, and there is a database of over six million thesis and dissertation uh, with full text available for most of them. So there are tools to reach thesis and dissertation, which would be very useful at the beginning of your studies of your uh, literature search. Conference proceedings, reference material, encyclopedias, dictionaries, thesaurus, like what I found in clinical key. Reports, which may be published separately, which may fall under the gray literature, which may be in an institution's repository. And of course, there are patents where government authority license and gives the right or title for a set uh, over a period of time, for the sole right to make, use, or sell an invention. Let me go on. This is a very useful little tool. I've used this many times, the similar tool in discussing how to evaluate material on the internet. So we have this little loop. We start with, okay, users must critically evaluate the appropriateness of all type of information. So it is your responsibility to decide if this is good information, useful information. Authority, who's the author? What affiliation? What educational background? What is the area of expertise? And this is especially true on the internet now with all the quote unquote fake news. Okay, author is published in an academic or peer reviewed journal. So that's the first thing. Accuracy. Is the information provided based on proven facts? In other words, you look at the article and you say, oh, I understand how they did their research and their methodology and their statistics are, statistics are legitimate, and therefore this is a very accurate and useful article. 
it's also nice to see a page free of spelling mistakes and obvious, other obvious problems. Third, objectivity. What do you know about who is publishing the information? Is it a commercial, a big one in health is commercial agenda. Who funded the research? Did a pharmaceutical company fund the research? Now that may still make the research acceptable, but you need to know this and you need to understand the bias. Does it try to inform or persuade you in an inappropriate way? This is especially true with the uh, fake news. How balanced is the presentation? So you're doing your own analysis of the article. Does the information cover meet your information needs? Is it basic or comprehensive? Is it relevant to the topic? So that's number four, coverage. And the last one's pretty easy, currency. When was it published? When was the website list last updated? When was the article published? Is it important for your information needs? This is especially true, say, with uh, COVID-19. Something published a year ago has maybe uh, superseded by much more research and much more analysis and many different uh, clinical options. Okay, here's the bibliography where I got this information from. I will go on to the next one. Using information resources, outline, literature search, search strategies, refining a search, Boolean parentheses, search limits, how to formulate a research question. Okay, so let's go. Literature search, I really like this quote, so I'll quickly read it. Systematic and well-organized search from already published data to identify a breadth of good quality references on a specific topic. The main purpose of a thorough literature search is to formulate a research question by evaluating the available literature with an eye on gaps for further research. So that's why you're doing a literature search. The various search strategies can, for carrying out a literature search mainly depend on the stage of your research. Simple search, quick first step outline of resources. You can use Scholar, you can use a library catalog, you can use a Wikipedia, you can type in a single subject or a phrase, you're gathering background information, okay? You can also look up specific journals, it's noting there, or a journal name in a search engine. Systematic, building a query requires more comprehensive search strategy. Complex piece of research which aims to look at this, identify, select, and synthesize all the research published on a particular topic. It can consist of search items using Boolean operators, advanced search techniques, and building a query. So what happens when you start finding good articles? Snowballing. Snowballing involves using the key publication as a starting point. And you look at the references at the bottom. Or if you're in PubMed, it says additional articles on this subject uh, down at the bottom of uh, abstract. So you have your key publication and you look up related publications. And the related publications may cite some other previous research that is useful for you in your literature search. It helps you find a lot of literature quickly and easily. Okay, so I have found this little uh, graphic, which really is the literature search cycle. Okay, I, in blue, identify main concepts, keywords, spelling, synonyms. Then you go to catalogs, you go to journal databases, you go to other resources such as uh, PubMed or Agris. Okay, search resources. You use Boolean operators, you proximity searching, truncation, whatever you prefer to use. Finally, you review and refine the results, evaluate the results, rethink the keywords, identify other sources. And also, if you find uh, in a database or a publisher that says you can create a, an alert please do that so that you'll be notified of new material in this specific subject area. Okay, we go on. What should you do? Cyclopedia is a good start. That's only about background book and review articles provide an introduction. Then you have to narrow your focus. Okay, the four W and H questions are a great way to start. So let's look at that. I hope this is clear enough for everyone. For this example, 
you and I actually did I have the answers here. So you have what, where, who, why, and how for the topic of environmental issues in agriculture. Okay, so I have actually gone through this and come up with the answers. What would be food security, pesticides, and generally modified food? What are the environmental issues? Where? Where are environmental issues most threatening to agriculture? And the answer is the whole world, US developing countries, European Union. Who? Who are affected by these issues in agriculture? And the answer to that are customers and farmers. Why? This, this started out in the European Union study. Why do the European Union subsidize agriculture that promotes environmental issues? And the answer to that was foreign pressure and in the industry lobby. How? How do environmental issues impact on agriculture? And the answer to that was monocultures and biodiversity and medication in waste water. So you can do this with your research question. What, where, who, why, and how? Okay. I, my time is winding down, so I'll be not too fast, but hopefully cover the last few slides. Uh, developing a search strategy. This is a good graphic that takes you through each step, asking your question, defining your needs, identifying concepts, selecting terms, selecting sources, doing a search, revising the search, managing the search, evaluating the quality of the information you have. So you can, in the process, if you're getting lost a bit, you can go back to these steps and see where you are. Okay, refining a search. Think critically and judge what information is relevant. There's no such thing as a perfect search. A filter enables, enables you to refine your search. A filter can be applied before a search or during a search. Okay, search filters are used to evaluate and improve your search query. Uh, appropriate information is retrieved. Okay, you know that sometimes, especially in Scholar, you can get huge results with a broad topic. So you need to connect your string of words in a specific way that makes it more manageable, okay? Uh, remember all searches do not function the same way in all databases. Uh, so we can quickly go over and, all, and not, or and, not, the Boolean operators and combines two terms or uses it to uh, to contain a term or other terms to broaden the search, not uh, excludes certain terms and narrows the search, okay? Uh, many of the tools use proximity, phrase or proximity searches by using quotes or parentheses. So you put crop plant, plantation in. Truncation and wild cards is an asterisk or a dollar sign. So you get child for an uh, uh, asterisk for child or children's or children, and then the alternate spelling can be handled with the question mark. Uh, note that some of the more sophisticated uh, search tools like PubMed use a lot of artificial intelligence, and they say don't even bother putting anything in. Just put in the keywords and we'll figure it out for you, which is very hard for people who have used these tools for many years. You have to change your strategy. Okay. Uh, search limits. Most databases allow you to limit a search by author, title, journal, database, and language. Some of the more sophisticated databases have even more options. This is just a Google Scholar search that can be limited by uh, years, relevance, or by date, include patents, include citations. I'm sure you've all used data uh, tools that have many more options, usually in the left hand column. Okay. There is a longer bibliography to all these. Again, these are all articles that you can open or websites that you can open and get more details on how to go through this process. I think at this point I stop and we do chat for maybe three minutes and then I have a couple more slides that segues into the next part. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to look at the question. Yeah. Uh, we actually have it in Q&A, and there is one I can see is they talking about uh, literature search is uh, somebody, Elisa was saying that at times the difficulty with snowball literature search is the question of where to stop searching. 
for the literature. Could you please help in defining the optimal, optimal search stopping point for reviewing? Otherwise, they just keep on reviewing. Yes, uh, it's a very valid question and there's no simple answer. You as the subject expert, as the researcher, need to decide when you have sufficient information. Otherwise, as you say, you get in this hole and you keep going and going and going. So you, you, you'll you see that some when you start hitting a point where the articles are more tangential and they're not really precisely on what you are, uh, your literature search is trying to find out, that's when you stop. That would be my only suggestion. But you're the uh, subject expert, you're the discipline expert. So it's really up to the individual to decide. I'm not sure that helps answer the question, but it puts it in a bit of a brief framework. Okay, uh, we have a couple more questions there. Yeah, we have a lot of questions actually. <laughs> but oh, may or may my. not be, may or may not be uh, directly related to uh, literature okay. search. In in the questions that pre webinar survey, people do have some question about saying how how do their kind of research question guide them to find literature? How can their research question guide them to find literature? I, I, I interact like kind of they're related. Yes, I would say, uh, okay, your research, research question guides how you do the search. Mm -hmm. And as you search, you can see certain keywords seem to trigger the kinds of information you want. So they're really integrated to, the, uh, to a certain extent. You start out and you, and you kind of get more specific and more specific and identify uh, the, the information that you really need. Is that helpful? Do you want to add to it, Kathy? Well, I guess you, you, you keep the point and it's actually an iterative process. Uh, you are searching literature to, as you pointed out, or you will point out later about formulating research question. It, you, you find those information and then kind of trigger you how to formulate your yeah. question. And then you got a question and then you do the search. So it's an iterative process, I would say. Yeah, it may help if two or three people are working on the same literature search. And then you can talk with your colleagues and say, okay, we really need to focus on these words and these ideas. Yeah, but if you're doing okay. it individually, maybe at some point you ask your colleague, am, mm -hmm. I, am I using the right words? Can you make any su suggestions? Is this the kind of information I need to uh, begin my research? Well, I have one here is what is the best way to reach research articles, journals, since we will be reading a lot of content how do we ensure that we read this material in an efficient way? <laughs> so a lot to read. What is a way to do it efficiently? Uh, okay. I, I think some of what I said was you should start with some background information. And out of the background information, you define specifically the kinds of material you want. But then again, as you look at the abstracts, of the articles, you can say, yes, this is a higher priority. Yes, this one is really focusing on uh, identifying, and, and this will come up in the next couple slides I have, identifying the, back, uh, the information I need to further my research. So you can really use the abstracts to decide what is more relevant and what is more meaningful for you. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think we'll stop here for the, at okay. this point. We'll get more Q and A. So now we're moving on to because a lot of questions talking about how do we proceed from searching literature and formulating question and starting the research. So okay, do I have to share my screen again? Yes, uh, yes. We yes, don't see I think I... yeah. Yes, here I am. Okay, so. We've had this little discussion and now I'm going to help segue, move to the next part of our complex first webinar, okay? So here we are, let's see if this, okay. Arriving at your research question. Step one, 
what is my area of research? Step two, what is known so far in this area? Step three, what is not known in this area? And step four is which unknowns do I want to focus on in my research? And you see the first next line is to reach the third step, you need to do an extensive literature search, okay? Here's where a recent review article, now back to what I was saying, if you read some review articles, it really brings you up to date on the literature and you can focus better. It can save you time. You may find that there are unknowns. Within these unknowns could be a gap of knowledge, okay? But I like the last disclaimer, but this doesn't mean every unknown thing is important or relevant. So you're looking at the literature, you're looking at the research and you're trying to find the unknowns. So, okay, a scientific research paper will address uh, at most a few research questions. Recall those four steps. The fourth step was about which unknowns do I want to focus? Okay, why is it important to address a particular unknown or, or gap? Will it contribute to the knowledge on this field? Okay. Would your investigation into a particular unknown be relevant for an academic journal? And then again, do you have the means, the knowledge, the people, the funding, the background to direct your research to explore this unknown? So you're trying to help build on the literature about a specific topic by answering one of the unknowns. I really like that. Okay, how to formulate a research question. And again, there's a citation at the bottom, which gives you much more detail on formulating a research question. It should be clear. Everyone has to be able to understand it without additional explanations. It has to be focused, narrow enough that it can be analyzed in the research and also is publishable. Concise is expressed in the fewest possible words. I know we all want to stick in every, librarians especially, every little detail we know about something, but sometimes it's better to be concise. Complex, can it be answered? You don't want it to be answered in a yes or no, but rather requires synthesis, research, and analysis and sources prior to the composition of an answer. Arguable, is the answer open to debate rather than an accepted fact? Okay, so that's formulating a research question. Uh, here's a quick, 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 quick little quiz question. Research question is clear and specific that forms a basis of your research. Pick which one is the clearest and most specific question on this, okay? What types of pesticides might be exposed, bees might be exposed to, uh, are honeybees exposed to pesticides? And what happens when bees are exposed to pesticides. And I think for me anyway, the third was the most precise question, although you may disagree with my answer. Uh, research question checklist. Again, look at the source at the bottom. This live guide has much more detail on a checklist when you're developing a research question. Is it open-ended? Is it appropriate? Does it suggest factors that can be measured? Is it relevant to your audience? Is the answering the question manageable and can I find enough documents, statistics, people to provide information to develop and support the idea? That's your literature search. And finally, is this something you want to do research on? Okay, and I think that is my last slide. And now I turn it over to our colleagues again from the uh, Elsevier, from Elsevier. Researcher Academy. Yes, from, from the Researcher Academy. Thank you for listening to me for the past 20, 25 minutes. And it we'll continue to try Thank to answer you. your you. questions. Yes. So Anna and Yingxi, anything from you about formulating research question? You will share as yes. an example, right? That's yes. Great. So um, we got a it's not an example it's more well there's an example but this is more about um an approach you can use to uh while you're formulating a research question uh, lenny gave a very comprehensive um 
uh, uh, presentation on this. So this is more to add on it. The only thing is that this is used, as you can uh, tell a bit, it's used for uh, the medical uh, field, but I'm hoping that uh, nonetheless, that there can be some uh, learning uh, aspects for, for everybody in, in, in any subject area that you are. So uh, um, when you think about formulating a research question, an approach can be uh, using the PCOT method, which is P, it's, it stands for thinking about the patient or the population that's being studied. Um, if there's another uh, field, it could be also the theme, the topic in, in that sense. I, the intervention by the researcher or exposure of the patient. A C, a comparison with standard practice or uh, an O, the outcome or the results that you wanted to obtain uh, once you designed um, the study. And T, the time required uh, to get the results and the and the time frame of, 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 of the research in that sense. So this is an example of uh, by using this this method of uh, a research question that you can formulate in itself. So this um, what we had to add on on this of formulating research questions. Sounds good. Um, thank you. So we are going into an open end Q&A session and we have a lot of question in the, in the Q&A box already. So uh, some of them uh, either in C or Anna are saying that you will answer live. So would you first address those first so that you said you will answer live? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I have seen, I think, a, a couple of questions uh, regarding peer review. Uh, so expressing interest in participating in peer review and how you can uh, become a reviewer. Uh, so Research Academy, we do have a certified peer review course. It's on our website. It's completely free. It's a, it's a course series consisting of a dozen modules, uh, introducing all the basic principles and best, best practices of peer review. And we also have a volunteer, volume peer review program run uh, by Elsevier, where you can sign up to be a volunteer peer reviewer. And once you register in the program, you will be recommended uh, and you can also sign up for journals that you want to do review for. So these are the resources from our end uh, that can help. Uh, and I hope that answers some of the questions we see. OK. So um, I, I also accidentally type uh, answer live because instead of typing it. So just a quick one for me is somebody was asking for French translation again. Um, uh, we this is a pilot project, and it's actually if you notice that all our uh, topics in each webinar will be overview on something and doesn't really uh, on the topics, but not really going into very deep because obviously we don't have enough time. But we want to test on whether that can go. How much can we go? How much uh, would it be useful? So, so thank you uh, for bearing with us about this. And, and again, we, uh, at this point, we are not planning to offer certificate, but we still will present, uh, attend, uh, we'll drop down the attendance and, and see how, how does it affecting the impact. So um, is it, would anybody want to answer, in answer about the copyright of the, can you incorporate copyright in social media? I think everything can you can you can do that right in in you can cite something which is copyrighted but yes this... you can um so for the copyright yes you can uh what is normally not encouraged is to share your pdf file of your research because also um that can be seen as maybe a, a copyright uh violation in that sense Oh, yeah. if you have a PDF, but you can uh, share or you can also take a screenshot as well of, of the article and 
and in that sense. Right, right. Kathy, there, there are two questions at the end that I will attempt to answer. And you want to one, do it now? Sure, unless yeah. you have something. No, I'm just going through the box. To okay. see. We, we okay. actually kind of answered some of those already. Yeah. But they well, may these not be are tight. these are two that came in at ten in the last minute or two, mm -hmm. and they're at sure. the bottom. Okay, in research, one challenge to generate a valid and accurate, accurate evidence in the study participants, and they may not tell the real situation of interest, health due to social desirability biases, which is out of control. Uh, what? Are, how do you deal with this? And I, I am not a researcher who has been in the field and dealing with uh, these, these real-time situations. Uh, I remember from some anthropology studies that the uh, researcher, the author, uh, kind of puts a disclaimer in expen explaining that there may be these kinds of biases. And I don't know if this would apply to this kind of research situation, but uh, this real situation, as you put, where people may not be telling uh, the whole story, but you could at least put a explanation or a disclaimer in the research about these are the results I have, and they may be influenced by this situation. That's the only answer that I can come up with about that. Uh, others could add in. Then there's one about abstracts are not always enough. How can I gain access to the full body critical research resources which such articles are only accessible via subscription or payment beyond my ability? Now, uh, that is the why Research for Life originally got into the delivery of information, I don't wanna call it business, but process. So the first suggestion I would have is uh, make sure you have your username and password for Research for Life. Go in and do a uh, summon keyword search. You can put in the article title or the name of the author and see if you have access to it. What summons does is it grants access to what is available in your country. And sometimes publishers choose not to grant access to the uh, specific journals in your country, and that is a bigger issue that we are, we as Research for Life are always trying to deal with. But you may be able to get access through uh, searching in Summon. Another option is if you go into Research for Life and go to Google Scholar within Research for Life, and also this is true for uh, PubMed, there are links to the full text articles that are available at, in your institution. So you can do a Google Scholar a search within Research for Life and on the right column, you will see links saying uh, the publisher and says Research for Life and you click on that and can get access to the full text and the same thing in PubMed for Health. Kathy, you have anything to add to that? I, I tried my uh... best. Well, I think the other thing I also pointed out by ask somebody, I'll ask them a question. And don't forget about your libraries, your librarians, because even though, uh, uh, even with Search for Life have limits, you know, the collection you can access for with Search for Life uh, have limits uh, there, but, but your libraries can reach out to other libraries in the world, actually, to do something called interlibrary loan. Well, it's not really, this is like a term for paper journal, but these days uh, it's possible to say, for example, I know that some library can go to some network and even go to National Library of Medicine. Uh, I'm from the um, uh, health sciences world. So uh, that, you know, is a pathway to do that. And then of course, don't forget about your fellow researcher and they might have uh, access that you can grant, or just uh, directly to the user. I mean, the authors, they are willing to share, to telling them, citing why you want to get access and, and the question. And I think they will be more than happy to share their research with you. Yeah, so this is just what I add. Um, the other thing I can see is I just hopefully one of you can answer. 
actually all the panelists here, not just the one <laughs> for this webinar. I see other panelists in here too. There's our working team member. Um, how different is a research question from a problem statement? To me, I think problem statement is more generic. You know, you have a kind of, you know, hey, this is, you know, I can see the problem of the, the, uh, uh, the cops, the, 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 uh, the, the maize, you know, it does not growing well now. And, you know, let me find, find a solution for it. Is this, I can say it's kind of more like a generic problem, but then the research question is more specific. Because remember Lenny said, you have to be clear and specific. You cannot study everything under the sun, even for one problem area. So you have to be really narrow in, you have to find your literature and drill on that problem to see how much is known, how much is unknown, and what's unknown, which is you think uh, you can deal with and or your team can deal with. Usually research is not a one person thing. So then you can draft your research question from there. So as I said, it's an iterative process to kind of narrow it down. So yeah, I would I, think, anybody? Yeah. I agree 100%. Uh, you, may, you may just start out and it's a general question and you talk with your colleagues and then you start looking at it using the tools, some of the tools that I mentioned, or, and please go ahead and look at the bibliography and get more details about how to focus on the request, research question itself and how to do the literature search and go through that whole process. So uh, I agree 100% with Kathy about that, that it starts out with, oh, well, we're seeing this kind of problem in this crop. Now, maybe we have a technique here that may solve this problem. And that's just kind of general brainstorming. And you say, wait a minute, let me do a literature search on this. Wait a minute, let me get my key words that I'm using. Let me see what's available. Let me see what research has been done and how we can add to the body of literature. So then that's where the research question process becomes critical. And actually, formally, the research question is a very, very important step to gain either to get yourself funded to do it or get yourself published, both. Yeah. Because everything starts from there. What are you doing? And forget about how first do about what are you doing? What are you trying to do? What's the basis? And there was a question about how to, at the end, was saying about um, uh, successful application for a grant, it is all related to that. And you have to be clear and specific. It's an, it's you will, all the journal also asking for what is your piece of research contribute to the understanding, what add to it. If you're just repeating everything is already talking about out there, the chances of your research output paper might not be even accepted. So uh, at a highly unlikely level. <laughs> So, but, so that is very important. Every start from the beginning, don't think, you know, I can just go out and do a research and, 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 and thinking that uh, craft a paper out of it. So, yeah. Um, there's, Kathy, there's one quick one above that question. What about writing a systematic review? And that's a whole other issue because yeah. systematic reviews are based on primary research. Okay, and you have to identify the primary research. Uh, I suggest go, you go to Cochrane Library and it has a free course, correct me if I'm wrong, Kathy, about yes, how to yes. do a systematic review. Yes. And yeah, maybe if I type in my, uh, my email, you can remind me to give you more details on that. But yeah. there is a whole free course on writing uh, systematic reviews that would be very helpful. It's very complex. Yeah, actually, I will advertise on their behalf. It's online training course on Cro from all by Crockman Library. They are like a big one for doing systematic review. You can all research for life eligible country can access that training course for free, which is wonderful. So yeah. uh, which you can access through the database option 
from Research for Life content portal. Yeah. You go to uh, Open Research for Life. She's saying Open Research for Life, go to databases, go to Cochrane Library, and find the free course. Right. <laughs> well, that a simple maybe I that? can share my share, yeah. screen a little bit so that, uh, let me, wait a minute. Am I right? I try to, oh yeah, I can share this one. Is this right here? Uh, oh, I, it will be very access content, access content. Oh, that's not good. What the? Yeah, it's always when you do live, it's always this kind of problem. <laughs> and then from, is, is it supposed to be a database, right? I don't see Crocken. No, it's under reference. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Sources. Yeah. yeah. So under here. reference sources. And alphabetically, right? Journal. Yeah, this is not planned, but that's why. <laughs> oh, the other thing you can search is do, do the search content. Then I can say open and see what happens. Okay, here we go. Uh, Quokka Library. Yeah, we'll have to log in. But anyway, I think is the other thing is Quokka Interactive Learning, I think. So actually available in this site. And then yeah. you can just That's register true. it. And then the registration is it's not coming through Research for Life directly, but it's coming from them. Then you can uh, register um, for it. Anyway, so I will. Uh, do you want to um, go through a couple more? Oh, actually, we are kind of. Let me getting. stop sharing, getting there. So I will share. Well, just time to wrap up and I can try to share this one, I think. Yes. Okay. All right. So just a, a few minutes, two minutes to wrap up. And just many people ask, can we have the recording? Yes, you will. And uh, after this webinar, you will have a quick uh, post webinar survey. Please answer them for us because, again, this is a pilot project. We want to learn as much as we can so that to plan our future program in this area. So please answer the question either way away or we'll send you a link later. Please make sure you answer them and help us to plan further program if you want more program from that. And then the both the recordings of the session and presentation, the slides will be available in this site, which is the uh, under Research for Life. And then uh, you click on training and then there's a webinar. So, and this link will be uh, sent to you also when they are ready. It'll probably take a couple of weeks for this available. So you, you have all the slides and you have all the links. So advertise, if you advertisement, if you have not registered, I encourage you to do it now. Uh, if you are pretty quickly <laughs> um, uh, on next Wednesday at nine, also I wait nine. I'm in U.S. West Coast is my time. It's nine to three p.m. in U.S. Africa and whatever time frame you are in. It will be there will be a webinar uh, about open science and from open access to open research. So it's not just talking about. Uh, science, but also in uh, a lot of uh, research area as well. So we have a very good lineup at that, uh, on that. So uh, that will be about an, an hour instead of an hour and a half. So, and by all means, um, if you have questions, please send it to uh, the registration form if you haven't already. And especially when, they, when you got the reminder, then send it to them, it will be answers, answer. So, um, Okay, wait a minute. Do I get? It's interesting. It's not moving. 
Okay. Okay, that's the end of it then. <laughs> so, oh, by the way, I forgot about this. We have a very nice uh, research, more research resources from Research for Life partner, just like uh, Anna and Yingxi, they, they research for uh, the Research Academy is linked from here. So you just go to Research for Life training and more resources, then from the Research for Life partner, you can see a lot of push, publishing partner have a lot of information and training course, online training course that you can access for free from that site. So uh, this course is just kind of like a, a session, uh, like a representation of it. So I encourage you all to um, get access to it. So that's so much for now. And thank you very much for your attendance and you guys are great and and a lot of you hold on <laughs> thank you so much so we can stop now okay See, Kathy, we this. appreciate your coordinating the first one we know you have put a lot of energy into this <laughs> and we look forward to a, uh equally useful Yes. webinars for the next five all those yeah. subjects will change yeah do go back to the the view the 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 advertisement of the of the whole series and actually the question you've asked today a lot of them are being addressed by webinar say like we we're talking about ethics there will be that will be touch on predatory journal and such on webinar four Open access, uh, access to next week. We will talk about APC if you are interested in that. And then women of five and six is really big time on writing and publishing uh, your research output uh, more on the article side. And also we will talk about research impact of your research output. So do register and so that's so much for now. Thank you. Kathy yeah. Ashman had a good uh, point, but maybe for the future to add the reference uh, registration uh, site so they can directly register for the next webinars. Oh, in the in the site? In the chat. They were in saying, the chat. Oh, right. yeah. yeah, I can do that. Yeah, you can, can do I can that. Do that. Go now. ahead. Go Let ahead. Let me do it do now. That. And uh, that's sorry. Great. Just, Thank good you. Idea. Good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, let go. Oh, just take me a little bit to get the site.